Hi kids, I'm Josiah Milky, and welcome to Disney Animation Reviews. Uh, before we get started, I owe you an update that I should have told you on my last review. Last week, we got some new stuff to go with Ralph Breaks the Internet in the promotional stages. A uh, couple different things. We got a new poster with a lot of the key characters that will be in the film. Uh, two, we got a new song by the band Imagine Dragons called Zero, which will be playing in the end credits of the film. And three, and this is the most exciting one, we got a new trailer for Ralph Breaks the Internet. We get to hear more on the plot than what the previous trailers gave us. We get to meet some of the new characters like Shank and her friends from the game Slaughter Race. And we get a couple more Disney cameos. I can already tell Ralph Breaks the Internet is going to be awesome. But we still got a ways to go, so let's move on with our Disney Animation Review for today. After the Ember's New Groove, in 2001, Disney started the animated Saturday morning cartoon series House of Mouse, which ran for about three seasons over the course of almost three years, where Mickey and his friends put on a show at the titular House of Mouse, showing off a bunch of their cartoons to classic Disney characters. It was a pretty good show. In February 2001, they opened Disney's California Adventure, the neighboring theme park to Disneyland, and they released Recess Schools Out from Disney Toon Studios. Based off Disney's animated Saturday morning TV series Recess, uh, Recess Schools Out came out in mid-February 2001 and did decently well at the box office and got moderately good reviews. The subject of today's review is their summer release. Disney's 41st animated feature film, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Uh, picture this. October 1996, a Mexican restaurant in Burbank, California. Directors Gary Trousdale and Kirk Wise, producer Don Hahn, and writer Tab Murphy were having lunch there. They had just finished The Hunchback of Notre Dame a couple months before that. And at this lunch, they were trying to decide what to do for their next movie. Rather than do another musical, they decided to do a science fiction story uh, similar to the Jules Verne stories you've probably read as kids, like Journey into the Center of the Earth and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Around the World in 80 Days. That's what they were going for with their next animated Disney feature, a science fiction movie like those stories. The result, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Released in the summer of 2001, the film, while experimental and a good idea at the time, got mixed reviews and was a box office flop in America. It did better overseas, but it wasn't the success Disney had been hoping for here in the States. And to be honest, I don't care for this movie. Science fiction, I'm a sucker for science fiction stuff, but even I have my standards and Atlantis didn't quite meet them. I'll explain why as we go along. At the start of the movie, uh, we're told that thousands of years ago, the city of Atlantis was hit by a tidal wave and disappeared beneath the surface. It was protected by the Atlantean crystal, who took the queen and used her to protect the city. Years later, we go to Washington, D.C. and meet our main protagonist, Milo Thatch. Uh, he's pretty bland as far as Disney protagonists go, but I like his voice actor, Michael J. Fox. Uh, I'm... Probably best known Michael for voicing Stuart Little in the Stuart Little movies for Columbia Pictures, but Milo J. Fox does give Milo a good voice, even if Milo is a pretty weak protagonist. Milo spent his whole life studying Atlantis and trying to figure out where it is. It was his late grandfather's dream to find the lost city of Atlantis. The thing is, the guys at the museum Milo works at won't listen to him, but luckily Milo's luck is about to change when he meets... Preston Wetmore, a millionaire who knew Milo's father, and invites Milo to join an expedition to find Atlantis. Milo teams up with a ragtag group of explorers led by Commander Rourke, and they all set off to find Atlantis. One thing that Atlantis does get right is the diversity of the cast. You have the tough commander with Mr. Rourke, you have the tough girl of the bunch with Audrey, You've got an Italian guy with Benny, a big guy who's really a sweetheart, Dr. Sweet. Uh, you've got the toughest nails sidekick to Rourke, Helga Sinclair. Um, there's Mrs. Packard, the old lady. 
uh, Mole, the goofy guy, and Cookie, the old guy who's the chef. Um, great voice cast. Um, most of these are people I'm not as familiar with, but Pixar fans will probably recognize the voice of Cookie is the late Jim Varney, who for Pixar was the voice of Slinky Dog in the first two Toy Story films. This was actually Varney's last movie, and he died more than a year before the film's release. So, eventually, the gang reaches Atlantis, and Milo meets the beautiful Princess Kida, voiced by voice actress Chris Sommer, and the two of them team up to find out what's going on with Atlantis, but it soon becomes clear that Commander Rourke has other plans for the city to steal the crystal, and that's up to Milo to convince the rest of his explorers to stop Commander Rourke and save the city. Milo and Kida, while I don't care for Milo, Kida's actually a pretty strong heroine as far as princesses go. Uh, she's not like typical Disney princesses who are either damsels in distress or want true love. Uh, Kida's tough, because uh, she's a warrior kind of princess. And although at first she doesn't take kindly to the outsiders, once she gets to know Milo and understand him, and he to her, uh, they become sweethearts. Well, the love story was probably unnecessary for this kind of Disney film, um, I do like that they got it in there to keep some of that Disney magic. And I really do like Kida as a heroine. I think girls could learn a lot from her. Like I said, the diversity of the characters is fantastic. Um, the villain with Commander Rourke is pretty two-dimensional as far as villains go. He's just out for money, like Governor Radcliffe and Pocahontas, or Clayton and Tarzan. I really do like the machines that they built, and rather than create, than use an existing language or history like in Pocahontas, Atlantis has its own history. And their language was developed by a guy named Mark Oakgrind, who also develops the Klingon language for the Star Trek films. So that's kind of cool. The score by James Newton Howard, who also scored the Disney film Dinosaur, is pretty amazing. Uh, great voice cast, like I said, Michael J. Potts, Chris Simer, and those people. But overall, the while the um while the score and the animation is pretty good, I actually the score is really good and the animation is moderate at best. The story and the characters uh, keep the film from being too great. Two dimensional villain, weak protagonist. Uh, we get some backstory on the other explorers, but we don't spend enough time with them to really get to know them, so it's kind of it's kind of disappointing. You've got all these great characters that come from different backgrounds, but you never actually get to know them. So, overall, music is fantastic, animation's okay, story and characters make the film too weak. So, I would say uh, this is one you can probably do without unless you want something different than the typical fairy tales from Disney. Atlantis was going to have a spin-off TV show called Team Atlantis, which continued the stories of Milo and his fellow explorers. Uh, but obviously because Atlantis underperformed at the American box office, the TV show was scrapped. But three of the episodes made its way made their way onto a direct video sequel, Atlantis Milo's Return, released in spring of 2003. Uh, showing Milo and the gang going off on new adventures, and Kida goes with them and is able to experience the outside world. Most of the original voice cast came back, although James Arnold Taylor took over for Michael J. Fox as the voice of Milo, probably because Michael was working on Store Little 2 at the time. And Steve Barr took over for Jim Varney as the voice of Cookie, obviously because Varney died before the first film even came out. The Atlantis I don't care for, but the sequel is even worse. It's definitely along the lines of Tarzan and Jane and Cinderella 2, Dreams Come True, where it's basically just a bunch of episodes from a disjointed TV series all mushed together to create one movie. And it's, yeah, Atlantis 2 is definitely one of the weaker sequels. Atlantis' latest home video release was its two-movie collection Blu-ray release with the sequel in the summer of 2013. But while the Ember's New Groove and Kronk's New Groove two-movie collection Blu-ray had no bonus features except on the DVDs, Atlantis and Atlantis 2 on Blu-ray do have bonus features. Atlantis includes deleted scenes, audio commentary from the directors and producer, Gary Charles Dale and Kirk Wise and Don Hahn, uh, several behind-the-scenes features, 
a Disneypedia comparing stuff in the movie to real life stuff and the film's original theatrical trailers. And the only bonus feature on the Atlantis 2 side of things is one deleted scene. So that's my thoughts on Atlantis The Lost Empire. I do appreciate Disney was trying to do something different by doing a science fiction story rather than another fairy tale, but somehow it just kind of faltered and never truly took off. So, yeah, I would say skip this one unless you're dying for something different, but I do think Disney improved in science fiction stories with the animated Disney features that are coming up next. Well, that's all the time we have for today, kids. Remember, when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Goodbye.